Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my Total War Warhammer Osland lore video. And today we'll be covering the province of Osland and all of the lore involved therein. So let's get going, shall we? So Osland, if you don't know, is placed in the northeastern corner of the empire, and it kind of has a upside-down L shape to it. It really is the most sparsely populated province of the empire, as well as being located on the frontier of Kislev, and really the northern wastes and the chaos wastelands as well, making it very much a sparsely populated frontier kind of province. Originally, these lands were settled by the tribe known as the Udosses, and they met at the moot with Sigmar before he launched into the Battle of Blackfire Pass, where he asked them to join him. They were being led at the time by a chief known as Wolfilla, and they spent three days debating whether to join Sigmar in his endeavors. Eventually they did, but it was after some really heavy haggling and deal-making on behalf of Sigmar to get them to join up in the first place. So they did become a founding province of the Empire, and over the first millennium of the Empire, they really started to expand the region of Osland well into the lands of what is now known as Kislev. So it was a much bigger province originally, and they built a number of forts in the northeastern corner to try and solidify their claim to that land. However, these sort of times of expansion could not last forever, and by the time of the second millennium of the Empire of Man, they started to become untenable, and eventually, after what they perceived as the treachery of the Talibheim Emperor, probably during the time of the Free Emperors, which was a time of extreme civil unrest within the empire. They had to withdraw, and that coupled with the Ungol invasion coming into Kislev, they have to withdraw from their holdings within Kislev itself. But because Oslin has very much been at the frontier of the empire, they've often been susceptible to conquest, to roving war bands, to just any kind of chicanery from Kislev, or anywhere else, and so they've really become a very hardy and warlike people and have been prepared to fight off invader after invader. However, from time to time, the invaders tend to win out, and although maybe don't end up conquering the empire as a whole, have on occasion devastated the entirety of Osland. One of the most famous examples of this was with Gorfor the Cruel, probably the most famous beast man within Beastmen legends themselves, Gorfor led a war herd out from the Middle Mountains and absolutely ravaged the entirety of Osland, putting entire cities and villages to the sword, and no one could really stop him, and he marched and essentially slaughtered vast swathes of the population of Osland itself, before marching down to Talabekland and eventually being stopped by the returning Knights of the Blazing Sun, who had just come back from Crusade. So they eventually managed to stop him, but he did march through the entirety of Osland and slaughtered the majority of its population. More recently, in the Warhammer timeline, Osland's also been put to the sword by a band of chaos. Now this started around the year 2512, so technically around 12 years after the start of Total War Warhammer. What happened was the chaos wins and Chaos Energies had started to build up in the north again, and the Norskans, sensing this, started to get a little bit revved up, they could kind of sense the coming of the power of their gods, started to G themselves up, and as things happen, when the winds of Chaos begin to build, they're like, oh, we're going to get another Ever Chosen, it's going to be great, we're going to go campaigning, we're going to go warring, woohoo! But let's get some pre-warring done just for fun and just to remind everyone that Chaos is here. So they set off on a renewed bunch of raids across the northern coast of the Empire, including taking out a number of villages on the coast of Osland. And so they began pillaging much more frequently than they had done in previous years. This prompted kind of a meeting of the Empire and them trying to deal with the situation. Indeed, the naval fleet was dispatched from Nordland, and they began to fight off the Norsecan raiders on the Sea of Claws itself. But for some, this was not enough, and the Count of Osland, who is a chap called Valmir, and his son Oleg, 
had decided to take the fight to the raiders themselves. This had never really been done by the Empire previously, to actually go and attack Norskan settlements and destroy them, rather than just taking them out on the sea when they were threatening to attack the Empire. So, Count of Osland and his son set about doing this. The Count of Osland had some relative success. He'd sort of put several Norskan settlements and put them to the sword, completely destroying them. His son, however, was much more successful. And I think his tally was he managed to destroy about seven coastal Norskan villages, killing every man, woman, and child therein. And so this was a new strategy. And once the Norskans got wind of this, they were absolutely enraged such kind of sacrilege had never been committed against them before and they gathered together a council to put together a fierce army of Norskan warriors to match and seek vengeance against these Oslander upstarts who would dare go into Norskan lands and out of the ranks of the Norskans emerged a champion Mortkin now Mortkin had already committed a number of famous deeds in the chaos wastes he's said to have slew the leprous council and in so doing had gained the favor of Nurgle. He outwitted an ancient fire dragon and so had gained the favor of Zinch and had bested a two-headed giant in a test of strength, earning the favor of Korn. And Korn sent him a further test of having to fight Valkyr the Bloody, who he fought for several days. And if you guys don't know who Valkyr the Bloody is yet, uh, do check the top right hand corner and that will take you to my missing legendary lords of chaos and that will give you some lore on Valkyr. But Valkyr and Morkin had fought for several days without stopping and eventually just managed to fight each other to a standstill with no clear victor. No one had ever managed to best Valkyr the bloody before and so Korn even took more favor upon Mortkin and sent him on his way being very impressed with this Norskan warrior. So he was highly regarded amongst the gods. He put together a fierce fighting force of his own known as the fell legion and he'd become a norskan very highly thought of in their society so he set about swearing to his other norse that he would get vengeance for them if they were to join under his banner so once mortkin made this promise all of the other norse were like okay yeah we'll put our legions of iron reavers into your charge you can go down south and get revenge upon osland having gathered this army on his charge south he managed to pick up a few other champions of chaos who would join under his banner the first was kargorok the bloodthirster and with kargorok who was a bloodthirster and thus a demon of corn came a whole slew of demon legions who Korn had sent to help out Mortkin in his quest for vengeance. He'd also encountered Zakor the Sorcerer, the master of the Coven of the Eternal Eye, who was a powerful Chaos Mage who would join the forces of Mortkin as well. And finally, he was joined by Lord Hockbile, who would come to his aid and bring other forces. So with this massive host of Chaos Warriors, Mortkin plowed through all the resistance Kislev had to offer, making straight for the lands of Osland. Having just entered the lands of Osland, however, he did a ritual with Zarkor, where they managed to summon the Lord of the Beastmen in the Forest of Shadows, which is a huge forest that covers a large portion of Osland. And in doing this, they summoned Ulrock the Red, who was the leader of the Beastmen at the time, again swelling the already vast ranks of Chaos forces that were hammering down on Osland. No army of Kislev or of the Empire at this point could stand against the forces that had gathered and Mortkin ravaged his way south, putting towns to the slaughter behind him. All of the survivors fled to the town that was probably the most heavily fortified in Ostland at the time, of Volganov, and that's where they held up, looking to make their final stand for the survival of the people of Ostland. Now, in the meantime, Mordkin, looking to avenge himself, particularly upon the von Raukens, who was the Elector Count and his son, he took over their ancestral home, known as Castle von Rauken, one of the settlements in Total War Warhammer, and killed all the von Raukens therein, assassinating a large portion of the Count's family tree. Amongst the most significant of the casualties was the Count's wife, 
who had been put to the sword. However, the target of Mortkin's rage, Oleg particularly, had managed to escape with his elder brother Vasily, and they'd managed to make it to Volgenhof. So once Mortkin had destroyed the ancestral home of the von Raukens, he moved over and set his sights on Volgenhof, where he wanted to still avenge himself upon Oleg and end his life for the villages he took on the coast of Norska, one of which happened to be the boyhood home of Mortkin himself, which really aided to fuel his lust for revenge. At this point, with all the favours of the gods as well that Mortkin had attained over the years, and with his new conquests of charging south through the lands of man, Chaos Energy had begun to form a kind of corona of burning flame around him. He was that blessed by the gods. So you can really see him becoming more and more of a creature of chaos. Not a spawn, but really a champion. Now, at this time... The Ever Chosen hasn't been picked, really. When the Winds of Chaos build up like this, an Ever Chosen is usually picked. Now, each of the greater powers of Chaos usually kind of put their own guy forward as a solution. And Mortkin was one of these who had been presented, along with the eventual Ever Chosen, Archeon. But Archeon at the time is still off questing. It's not been decided that he's the Ever Chosen at this point. So it's kind of up in the air. And at the time of this telling, Mortkin is very much in the lead. He has charged into the lands of man. He's brought many of the Chaos forces under his banner. He's winning. He's conquest. He's providing skulls for the Skull Throne. All is going very well, and he's becoming more and more infused with the power of chaos, making him a more and more powerful warrior. So he arrives at the walls of Volganov and demands the sun. And no one within the walls is in any doubt as to who he's referring. He wants Oleg. And he's seemingly offering a deal where if they give him Oleg, he will let Volganov be. That's what he wants. That's the target of his vengeance. Now, the people being very prideful and very proud of their count, were never going to let him take the favoured son of the count, who was Oleg. Of course, there is his elder brother, Vasily, but being kind of a sickly uh, wuss. Vasily's not really liked in the kingdom of Osland, and his father doesn't like him that much either. So Oleg is very much the kind of prime son, if you will. Mortkin gave them a day to decide and strode back into the woods where most of his horde had camped for the evening. He returned the next morning astride a juggernaut, which was yet another gift from the chaos god Khorne, and demanded they hand him over. The only thing that greeted him, however, was cannon fire and them trying to range in their cannons on Mortkin himself. Mortkin, being unimpressed by this display, just slowly turned and marched back into the woods and gave the war cry for his hordes to march forward. And so they did. Zakor the sorcerer, who had joined Mortkin earlier, weaved his magics and managed to bring up a powerful spell that completely destroyed a section of the wall of Volganov. And at that point, all the forces of chaos rushed for the gap. The men of Oslin began to waver, seeing this horde and the wall having just been torn apart like it was nothing. And some of them start to think about fleeing. But Oleg marches to the front of the battlefield and rallies all of the troops behind him. And rallies all of the troops behind him. The first thing they meet are the legions of demons led by the bloodthirster himself. And by some miracle of combat or strategic genius, the imperial soldiers actually manage to overcome this force of chaos demons. Only then to be confronted by Mortkin leading his fell legion itself into the front line of battle and they begin to carve a bloody path through the Imperial Army, just allowing nothing to stand in their way. At this point in the battle, Oleg and Morkin lock eyes and start to charge towards one another to meet in single combat. Oleg, being the swifter of the two warriors, armed with the ice blade gifted to him by the Queen of Kislev herself, laid down several devastating strikes upon the armor of Mortkin, striking to and fro, landing blows that surely would have felled any other 
man, but Mortkin failed to react. The blows did not even register, and with a single strike of his immense sword, Mortkin brought Oleg crumbling into what seemed like a bloody pile of flesh. But Oleg, half dead, out of sheer will and not wanting to give up the fight, began to try and rise again despite being obviously mortally wounded by anyone's standard Oleg began to rise Morkin seeing this pathetic pile of blood and flesh beneath him trying to rise again and feeling all the rage and anger he did at this man for daring to destroy his boyhood home simply laid a mighty armoured foot upon Oleg's breastplate and began to press down. The armor began to crumble and creak and eventually completely collapsed, rendering Oleg's once proud chest into a inverted puddle of blood and bone and flesh. Oleg had been killed, Mortkin had avenged himself upon the man who had ruined his home. At this moment, with the Chaos Gods watching him, he began to feel a surge of Chaos energy within himself. He could feel the world around him in a different way. He could sense there was a horde of demons scratching at the veil between the two realms, ready to be summoned forth by Mortkin. Perhaps Mortkin even being on the verge of taking up the mantle of the Everchosen. But at this moment of his ascension, at this moment of trial, triumph, Mortkin dropped his sword, lifted his helm, and uttered the words, The Virgild is paid. Let Volgenhof burn to pay for my home of Ulfenic. Never again will I return there. My saga is ended. I choose now to die as a man, my will my own. I go now, too late mayhaps, to the halls of my fathers. And with that, he dropped to his knees, being slightly in shock. It took the men of Osland a moment to react. But quickly, any man who could set upon Morkin, stabbing him with halberd and sword, and quickly rendering asunder the body of this once proud champion. Mortkin, perhaps as a point of pride, had turned away from the offer of the Chaos Gods. And at that moment, all the gifts they had bestowed upon him left, but he had the pride to die the man he once was and a man who decided his own fate rather than being a puppet to the Chaos Gods. Having seen their master struck down, the Crimson Reapers quickly leapt to their feet, slaughtering any man who had dared laid a hand upon him, but it was too late. Mortkin lay dead, but the Crimson Reapers formed a circle around their once Grand Master and forbid anyone from getting anywhere near him, be they demon, warrior of chaos, or empire soldier. And eventually people realized they would not move away from the corpse and began to left this clear space around the spot that Mortkin had fallen. Now, just to clarify guys, a Veer Guild is kind of just like a debt. Either a debt of blood or a debt of souls, just in case you didn't know, that's what the Norskans kind of refer to it. So the fact that Oleg had destroyed his homeland, that had instilled the Virgild on him and that's what he was going for. So the battle continues to rage around them. The horns of the right guard are heard as a reinforcing army charges towards Volgenhof. In this army, the Reichsguard have their captain, Kurt Helborg. Ludwig Schwarzhelm is in their ranks, as well as Count Valmir himself, who had been away trying to get reinforcements to help fight back the army of chaos that had marched over his homeland. And they sweep towards the city, but in normal circumstances, that would still be a fight that's not necessarily won, so vast was the chaos horde that still fought on. However, without the leadership of Mortkin, and having seen him fallen, the chaos horde began to fight amongst itself, trying to settle their own debts, their own Veer Guilds of ages past, and just began to collapse uh, internally rather than necessarily being solely defeated by the incoming army. If you'd like to know a bit more about the Empire characters I just mentioned of Kurt Helborg and Ludwig Schwarzhelm, do check my Missing Legendary Lords Empire video popping up in the top right hand corner now or in the description below after this video.
So they charge in, and with the help of Chaos fighting itself internally, they manage to drive off the armies of Chaos. However, the damage is already done. Volgenhoff was burning just as Mortkin had bade it so, and it burnt itself to the ground. There was nothing left, and now, in this day, there's nothing left of the town of Volgenhoff except an ashy ruin. So Count Valmir had lost his favourite son, left with only his sickly inheritor, really, to take over the throne afterwards. The damage had been done once again to Osland. That is the most recent raid of the region, and one of the reasons why, perhaps, it is one of the most sparsely populated regions of the Empire, and why the people there are hardy, slightly downtrodden, but, you know, still take a deep amount of pride in being on the frontier of the Empire, perhaps even the Empire's shield against the forces of chaos. So moving on, let's take a look at the geography of Osland. Here we see the old heraldry on the left and the Total War Warhammer heraldry on the right. Now, maps of Osland showing all the different sites that are mentioned within Total War Warhammer and are mentioned in different sources, I found to be a little bit tricky. There are some maps that show some things, some maps that don't show other things. So where on this map there are places that aren't necessarily covered by this map, where the town hasn't been written in, perhaps because when this map was written, or just comparing it to when law was introduced for Osland, I'll just point out areas with a circle to give you sort of a rough location of the area I'm talking about. But Osland is really split into three main regions for the most part. We have the Forest of Shadow, this large area of wooded forest here. Now the Forest of Shadow itself is a dark and dangerous place. And the people who live and work in the forest, which is a large portion of the population of Oslin, could swear that the forest is almost resentful of their presence there. Woodmen have often, when they've gone into the woods for long periods of time, seem to swear that paths shift and move behind them in an attempt to get them lost in these woods and perhaps even have them die within these woods. So they get the sense that this is not a friendly forest by any means. It's said to contain many secrets, often being described as similar to a mad wizard's attic. But many of the secrets of this forest have never been shared with the men of Oslin. So there are many things that lurk deep within its depths that they are unaware of. Some aspects they are aware of, however, are the monstrosities that live therein. Giant spiders, clans of goblins, beastmen, all of which can fall upon the men of Osland in a sudden craze, in a sudden ambush. And so they are always on guard when in the Forest of Shadows. At the moment, the beastmen of the region, who tend to be numerous but scattered until they gather into a war herd, which does happen from time to time, but the current leader, the current sort of prime leader of beastmen in the region, is a chap known as Ragash the Bloody, who is a minotaur who has a particularly unsatiated hunger for flesh and often likes to kill and store bodies of his victims for later. However, his storage method is a bit strange. He skewers them upon tree branches, and so there are often many trees in the Forest of Shadows where you will find bones or fresh corpses upon its branches, where Ragash has saved a meal to eat later. There are also some other stranger monstrosities that are unique to this region of the Forest of Shadows, namely a creature, or plant even, known as Blood's Edge. Now, Blood's Edge is a bushel, shall we say, that is sentient and moves and will grab and soak up the blood of any creature who dares to move close enough to it. So that's Blood's Edge, a particular bushel one must watch out for in the Forest of Shadow in Oslin. The next region we'll look at is the Middle Mountain. So the mountain range here in the middle of Oslin, as Oslin kind of curves around it. Now, the Middle Mountain was once home of an independent kingdom of dwarves, and their city was known as Karaz Gumzal. Now, Karaz Gumzgol declared independence during the War of the Beard, and they declared independence from, uh, because where they originally came from was Karaz Angkor. And they just said, look, we have this middle mountain area, we're just going to run it ourselves. However, after a time following the War of the Beard, 
the dwarves of the Middle Mountain shut up their gates, buried all the entrances to Karaz Gumzel, and destroyed all the roads that had once led to those entrances. And they retreated back to Karaz Angkor. They never spoke to men about the horrors that had driven them from their mountain home, but no one has discovered what exactly the cause of their abandonment of the Middle Mountain was. Now the Middle Mountain is often held by the forces of chaos. In Total War Warhammer, the only city in the region is really Brass Keep, but Brass Keep is often uh, not necessarily an empire hold, but really held by the forces of uh, chaos or some other nefarious army such as the Skaven or the Gobos. And indeed, it's where Gorfor, the most famous beastman, descended from in order to absolutely ravage the province of Osland. So that's the Middle Mountain area. The only area that is free of the Forest of Shadows is to the north of the province, near the border of Kislev, and that region is simply known as the Northern Marshes. Not particularly fertile, not particularly great to live in, but hey, at least it is not the Forest of Shadows to the people who live there. So that's where they choose to make their home in the northern marshes of the province of Osland. They also have access to some of the better defences in Osland, being the home to many of the northern forts that were built initially to advance into the kingdom of what would one day become Kislev, when in the early days of Osland, where they tried to expand the province northwards. Now let's have a look at some of the sites and cities around Osland itself. Starting up north at Salkilton. Now, Salkilton was one of those cities that are built also in the province of Nordland. If you haven't seen my Nordland video, do, as always, check out top right-hand corner, or it'll be in the description below. But it too, like one of the coastal cities of Norden, was built to try and replace Marienburg. The idea being that Marienburg was this hub of trade, and Salkerton thought, hey, we can be a trade hub as well, despite being really at the northern edge of the empire and not having access to the western seas or the western trade routes. But they still thought, hey, you know what, at least we can be a center of trade with perhaps Kislev and the traders from Kislev coming across to trade with the rest of the Warhammer world. So that's why this city was set up. However, being where it is, it is under near constant threat from Norsken raids, but it's often a hub for mercenaries who find plenty of work fighting off Norsken raiders off the northern coast of the Empire. Moving south now to Wolfenburg. Now, Wolfenburg was apparently named after Wolfgart Krieger, who was a great friend of Sigmar himself. And when Sigmar had kind of started to forge together the Empire in the year negative 30, he asked his good friend Wolfgart Krieger to try and defend the Empire against the threat of magic. And as such, Wolfgart set up an order known as the Order of the Silver Hammer. Now, this order would later evolve into what would become the Witch Hunters of the Empire now. But he was a great man, a great friend of Sigmar, and he's the man who apparently Wolfenberg is named after, or Wolfenberg is named after. The city really is a trade hub for trade coming in from Kislev. There is some mineral wealth that comes down from the Middle Mountain, but not huge amounts, bearing in mind that Osland is a horrifically poor province. So that is what Wolfenberg does. Trade hub, some mineral wealth, and it's described as being a truly beautiful city, however, one of the great sites of the province of Osland. Now under the control of the Van Rackens, it was once ruled by a family known as the, the Von Tassenniks, but they were apparently an inept ruling family and the Von Raukens overthrew them in Wolfenburg and took over the running of the city. Next up, we have an area of particular notoriety within Osland. The area known as the Black Thane. Now, it's a particular site. It's a small clearing in this patch of woodland where a huge four-sided stone stands in the center of it. On this stone are restraints whereby men or beasts can be held, and it is coated in a thick layer of dried blood and rust. There are bones scattered around this entire clearing, and on its edge is a vast pile of skulls. Now, the current keeper of this site of chaos, about which there are many that have been left in the Forest of Shadows, but this is one of particular note, is a keeper known as 
Bogoslov Tamen. And he was once just a man of Osland, but when he was walking in the forest one day, he felt this very strong call to him that sent him in the direction of the Blood Thane. And of once arriving at the Blood Thane, he saw a beastman there who was the keeper, and the two entered immediately into single combat. The battle was fierce and lasted for hours, but finally, in the end, Bogoslav managed to decapitate the beast man and the keeper of this particular shrine. The god Korn chuckled to himself in his realm of chaos as yet another skull had been offered to him. And so now Bogoslav, whenever given an opportunity, will rack up a victim against the blood thane, decapitate them and offer their skull to the skull throne. Moving to the southeast again, in Total War Warhammer, we do get the city of Castle von Rauken. Now, Castle von Rauken, I mentioned, Morkin uh, had sacked it and killed all the von Raukens therein. But that's really kind of in this area. I'm not sure why it doesn't show up in this map, but it's one of this area. I'm not sure if one of these towns is substituted for it in the modern Warhammer timeline because Castle von Rauken was sacked by Morkin. Now, the Warhammer timeline is around the year 2520, whereas the Total War Warhammer hammer timeline is around the year 2500 so there's about a 20 year difference in the two timelines so i'm not sure whether this is because morkin had sacked uh, castle von raukin uh, 10 years previously and these two towns had popped up in its place or because this map is out of date and castle von raukin still stands there i'm not 100 percent sure on the timeline on that one guys but castle von raukin is kind of this area the ancestral home of the ruling family of osland that's where their original castle was. And obviously in the Total War Warhammer world, it still stands there to this day. Now moving south, we have the town of Verzen. Now Verzen lies on the banks of the Rilla Talabak. It profits from some river trade. It is ruled by a character at the moment known as Baron von Wallenstein. Now Baron von Wallenstein is a very capable baron of this town. He runs it very effectively. Indeed, there have been some whisperings around that perhaps this baron should become Count of Osland. Now, little do most people know that these whispers have been started by agents of Talabekland, Osland's neighbor to the south. And the count there is looking to usurp the southern regions of Osland to add to his own province. And the baron is one of his willing partners in this endeavor, where he'll name him as kind of, you know, the grand overseer of the southern part of Oslo, but who reports back and, of course, pays taxes back to Talabekland. However, there are whisperings that the Baron himself is not only a double agent, but indeed a triple agent. And in the kind of a future timeline that I'm not sure is canon in the Total War Warhammer world, or for that matter necessarily at this point in the Warhammer world, but the Baron eventually even becomes a cultist of Slanesh. So he is really kind of a bit of a flip-flopper whose allegiance is flexible to say the best of the Baron, who seems capable but will stab you in the back for a penny or two. And that is the Baron of Verzen. Moving on to the people of Osland. Now, the people of Osland, first and foremost, are bull-headed. It's no coincidence there's a bull on their coat of arms, but they are said to be able to challenge the dwarves in terms of their stubbornness. Their very famous example being the amount of time, blood, and money they spent trying to hold their lands in Kislev during the second millennium of the empire, when everybody knew it would be impossible to hold on to, particularly with things like the Ongol invasion going on, but they seem to waste a number of their resources in that fight. One could argue to the point from which they still haven't recovered, economically at least, in the empire to this day. They're also a notoriously thrifty people. Many jokes go around Osland about the idea of Osland stone soup, and how Oslanders wouldn't waste two stones in boiling them up to make stone soup, because, you know, it'd be excessive. Two stones is frivolous when one can make stone soup with one stone. And that kind of also goes to not just them being thrifty, but also being completely broke as well. A notorious example of this thriftiness is when Count von Rauken was given the option 
to introduce gunpowder weapons into the armies of Osland, he initially resisted for quite a long time because he felt the introduction of these new weapons would just mean that men have to throw away perfectly good swords and spears which they had at the moment and that would be a complete waste and so that slowed down the adoption of gunpowder weapons within Osland, a province that one thinks might have particularly benefited from them as well. The people of Osland are also, you know, being in the north, it's cold and many northern countries tend to pick up this habit, is of absolute drunkenness. They love a good glass of vodka, they love to be inebriated, and so that is the people of Osland often found in a tavern getting absolutely wrecked. Now, the lifestyle of Oslanders is relatively similar across the board. Married men tend to become dirt farmers, maybe farming potatoes or roots or, you know, just any kind of subterranean plants mostly is what they go for, perhaps because of the chill that limits the things they can actually grow in the grounds of Osland. Non-married men tend to be a bit more adventurous, they tend to be huntsmen, trappers, woodsmen, and go off into the notorious forest of shadows and, you know, try and eke out a living from that. However, as I've stressed a couple of times, first and foremost, Osland is dirt poor, and it's even said that some Oslanders live their entire lives just haggling and never actually seeing money, because that's how poor they are, they could only trade, like, sheep for their wheat or for, for potatoes or they never exchange money money is just so rare in Oslin that some of them just never see it in terms of their looks being on the border of Kislev they have had some you know Kislevite blood in their bloodlines and even some Ungol influence there as well simply because Kislev has a lot of Ungol influence and so they're kind of a mixed bloodline uh, and look uh, fairly distinctive, perhaps particularly from their more southerly empire neighbours. They tend to be of extremes, the people of Osland, either being tall and slender or short and stout and, you know, much more muscular. That tends to be the only varieties. Most men will be bearded uh, in Osland as well, just because, you know, they're manly men. They need beards to keep their faces warm. And they are particularly fond of their own families. Family groups play an important role in Oslin society. Extended families may often even be living together in the same house, but they form together as units, they run their households as family units, and so family plays a hugely important role to the people of Osland. In terms of their jealousy and how they perceive the rest of the empire, they're not huge fans of people bringing up how much nicer other provinces are. Indeed, if you want a good decking in an Oslin tavern, do bring up how well the breadbasket provinces of the empire are doing in terms of food production and stuff like that. There, one Oslander will gladly walk up and knock you out flat if you start bragging about it. In terms of their religion, most of the major cities of Osland are oddly particularly focused on the worship of Sigmar. Now, it has been suggested in slightly contracting law, but that Sigmar is perhaps more recently adopted because like many eastern and northern provinces, the worship of Ulrich was more prominent within Osland, but at some point that changed and the worship of Sigmar, particularly within the cities, has become the dominant form of religious worship in the province of Osland. Now, some more cynical participants here have accused Osland of kowtowing to their richer southern neighbours like Reichland, and by worshipping Sigmar, have the hope that the richer southern provinces will perhaps feel more inclined to lend them aid from time to time in terms of some money for projects, or, you know, if, at the very least, some money for building more churches, to just kind of increase aid funding for the province of Osland, and that's why they apparently have turned more towards the worship of Sigmar, but surely only the most cynical amongst us would think that way. They just see the great glory of Sigmar himself and decide to go for it. The Count himself is said to have converted across to the worship of Sigmar from the worship of Ulrich at some point during his life. The worship of a couple of other gods as well of the Empire is also fairly prominent, but Sigmar and Ulrich are the main two. In terms of another odd quirk of Osland, is that Osland is home to a relatively large portion of ogres. 
Now, ogres have made a bit of a home in Osland. The idea of seeing ogres appear on battlefields of Osland in the regalia and the colours of Osland is not completely unheard of. There are ogre mercenaries who operate out of the area. Uh, perhaps one of the more famous of them is Erblag Rotgut, uh, whose regiment wears the heraldry of Osland, and they helped out a certain commander Bernhardt along his travels at one point. And they're a, you know, a particularly well-known unit of ogres. So that is Osland. They are known to have ogres in their armies. A number of ogres do live in Osland. And they've kind of made themselves a bit at home. Not as many as one, of course, would find in the ogre kingdoms themselves. But there are a handful of ogres who tend to wander around the province. In terms of some other military features one might see in Osland... There's also a unit known as the Bull Warriors. Now, there's some debate as to whether these are a knightly order or whether they're just kind of an elite warriors that have just been called Bull Warriors. Perhaps they wield great weapons. I'm not 100% sure. I couldn't find a lot of information about the Bull Warriors. But they're a particular army unit that comes out of Osland. And there's also a regiment of renown out of Osland known as the Firelocks of Ferlalgen. Now, Ferlalgen is kind of in the middle, no northern middle of Osland. And these chaps earned their reputation at a battle known as the Battle of Littered Bones, where they were fighting some Norsken marauders. And during the battle, which lasted, I think, a few, uh, several days, they at one point ran out of ammunition, but bravely maintained their position on the front of the battle, turning their rifles over and using them as clubs, which earned them the affectionate nickname of the Skull Crushers. So these guys are fierce fighters, and they don't give up just because they don't have any bullets. Let's bash in some heads, lads. Now, they oddly decorate themselves. They're a fairly superstitious lot. So they will tie these skulls and bones and aspects of their fallen comrades to their hats as a bit of a good luck charm. So they can look a fairly, um, I don't know, shocking unit with all these bones and things hanging off them. And people can't really figure out what's going on. If we ever do see these guys in Total War Warhammer, they'll probably be fearless because they refuse to surrender. They refuse to give up their bit on the front line. So, you know, very high leadership and give them like a bit of a buff to melee attack as well. Why not? So that is the Firelocks for, for Langen. Now, moving on to the Count of Osland himself, Valmir von Rauken. So Valmir von Rauken, the Count of Osland, the Grand Prince of Osland, the Margrave of the Northern Marsh. He is described as perhaps the most warlike of the Empire Counts, finding himself in a near constant state of war with the forces of chaos, Norsken marauders, beastmen, gobos, anything and everything that seems to threaten his land on the frontier of Osland. He is very aggressive, always looking for a fight, really could be described as a bit of a warmonger in his own right, and as we said, Valmir had his two legitimate sons, Oleg and Vasily, but he lost Oleg and Vasily is the only legitimate son remaining. However, Valmir has a bit of an eye for the ladies and is notorious to have a number of other children about the place and has had many affairs in his life. Now, of course, being single with his wife being slaughtered by Mortkin, when Mortkin destroyed the castle of Van Rauken. But he's known to have slept with a number of people, including the female ambassador of Kislev. He has a number of illegitimate children, one of which actually appeared in the Warhammer game Shadow of the Horned Rat as the captain of Fourth Nullen Halberdiers, and that was Boris Von Rauken. He's said to have been the eighth son of Valmir. So you count the two legitimate ones, that means he at least has illegitimate sons before Boris, and there may have been others after Boris. So, you know, quite a prolific bedder of women, shall we say, Valmir is. But always a loyal member of the Empire, always ready to fight in the Empire's defense. He is a brave and strong warrior and can do devastating damage. On the tabletop, in terms of if we ever see Valmir, it'll be very interesting because he's a great melee fighter with a ranged attack as well. So it'd be great to see him. He has his horse, which is his mount, 
Uh, I don't think his horse is named. He just w rides in an armoured horse. Doesn't get sentimental about his mount, unlike some other counts around the Empire. But he does have a rune fang known as Brain Wounder, quite uh, descriptively named. And he has something known as the Dragon Bow. Now, the Dragon Bow fires arrows tipped with dragon horns. And these dragon horns lend it a magical ability to be guided towards their target. And he's able to shoot... Uh, on the tabletop, three shots in one turn. So if you ever did get introduced into a Warhammer, it would look very much like the Wood Elves uh, weapon, the Bow of Kurnos, where you see those three projectiles fired at once. They have a good amount of aim and will probably hit their target. That's how I imagine them implementing it with Valmir. So he has the Dragon Bow, the Rune Fang, and he rides upon an armored horse. And that's really Valmir. I think he'd be a not very difficult lord to implement in Total War Warhammer. We have, they have all the animations. They have the range attack ready to go. It's just a matter of perhaps giving him his lovely beard, very much in that Mon sort of Mongolian style beard with his little hat with a skull on it. And there we go. You've got Valmir. So hopefully we will see him introduced at some point if we ever see anything coming out for the first game as supplementary content. But there we go, that is Valmir von Rauken. And that about sums it up for our Osland lore video, guys. Hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, please do drop a like if you did, and do subscribe for more Total War Warhammer content, and some more Total War Warhammer 2 content. And as always, guys, special thank you for watching, and a thanks to all my patrons, John, Reese, Colin, Thomas, Matthias, Samuel, Matthews, David, and Peter. Thank you, guys. And as always, guys, Hope to catch you on the next one.